um, is uh, sometimes, hey, we don't need more money. Whatever money we have right now does the job. Uh, there's fluctuations in demands of any kind. Uh, the price is fluctuating. We can have an increase or decrease um, purchasing power. And so therefore, uh, we might argue that, um, that the optimal amount of money is what we have right now. And, um, and while I, I hear the rock guardian stats on um, the, the basic conclusions of how fractions are banked in the free market, I, I, I would argue that, um, that the, the statement that we have the optimal amount of money right now is um, not generally the case, or more specifically, that in a free market, um, money fluctuates in supply is because previous to the fluctuation of the money supply increases. If we have a minting industry, that it, the supply of money will change because in fact the market demands that the supply of money changes and therefore, just like with any other commodity, there is no such thing as an optimal amount that in a free market such a concept would dissolve. What do you have? What do you think about it? Well, uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, the, the, the point is, it, it, it's, uh, any uh, claim that Rothbard made, and that I would also subscribe to, is that any of the money supply would be equally good. And so any money supply is equally optimal from an aggregate point of view. Now, of course, the question can be, how can we define the aggregate point of view? Is this, is this the, the point of the question? It would be, it would be, if, uh, if we had a free market, we had a, a minting industry, yeah. and the mints are minting, yeah. could an Austrian stand up and say, there is an example, and could anyone else stand up and say, there is an example of market failure. We do not need this new money, and yet oh. here we are. Oh, I see. Money. No, no, I mean, but, but that would be a wrong inference from the, from the premise, right? The premise is, all the, whatever the money supply is, that's equally good. So if, it's, if it increases because you have minting and mining going on, and the new money supply isn't as good as the old one, it's not better, it's not worse either. Yes, my question is concerned with this song. I'll ask a few and make an observation. Um, one is I, I read some uh, papers published by the Memorandum Institute of Riva, and I, I kind of have a question. That, how did the interpretation of RIBA as any amount of interest emerge? Uh, because it seems, you know, as an outsider, I, I'm not going to read these papers, it seems that it's very credible that the term RIBA or usury uh, applies only to excessive amounts of interest or non market rates, however you say that. Um, and I have a follow up as an American. That all the Muslims I know, of course, American. And I wonder, um, the Muslim entrepreneurs and businessmen that I know, I, how do Middle Eastern Muslims view them, or, or do they, if you're talking about rising uh, awareness of Muslim entrepreneurs and businessmen, um, how are American Muslim entrepreneurs and businessmen viewed by Middle Eastern Muslims, or is that kind of well set for them? Do you have a comment? Okay, well, I think the idea of interest as we understand in the modern world emerged in the modern era. Like in the Middle Ages, probably there wasn't a big difference. I mean, it was usual that you lend some, I mean, somebody lends you a lot of money and then gets 10 times of that or twice times of that. There's no idea of the inflation or there's no idea of it an ongoing kind of process. So I think in the modern age, people start to see that it's more clearly, and this debate came up. In the medieval times, Muslims used these techniques. And in for example, the Ottoman Empire, the Sheikh of Islam, he allowed the pious foundations for some limited interest taking. So even in the Middle Ages, they, they saw a difference. But the issue became a bigger, bigger, a big one in the modern age right now. And the, Muslim, the solution some Muslims find is to have this you know, non-interest banking uh, in the form of venture capital. Uh, you have those Islamic banks. In Turkey, we have 
if you Islamic banks, but other banks are just normal banks, and just people go whenever they prefer to. And I think in a free market, you can have all these options, and, and so you don't need to design an Islamic economy as something you want. Just have a free economy if you're Islamic. It's like a kitchen, a part of it's kosher, eat the kosher, it's a big kitchen sort of, I think, in a concept. As how Muslims look at well, it depends on which Muslims do <coughs> that. I think the, the fact that the, the Muslims in the U.S. are the, the average Muslim in the U.S. is quite different from the average Muslim in Europe, and I think that's an important difference. In the U.S., the Muslims, even the Turks, if you like, take a flight to New York from Istanbul and, and fl a flight to Berlin, you will see that the ones going to New York are middle class professionals or PhD students and so on. The ones who go to Berlin go there to work in a, you know, like a donut shop and you know, like a manual worker. And that's the case in, in, for most Muslim immigrants to Europe came as manual laborers. And the, the equivalent of that in the US would be Mexicans. Uh, whereas like most Muslims who went to the US became middle class, upper middle class. So probably one reason that the US does not have the so-called Muslim issue that Europe has in, in the same equivalence. There are some radicalized Muslims within the US for a reaction to US foreign policy, but at the social level, you don't have the ghettoization uh, and the feeling of alienation, I think, in the US society. That's also maybe related with the tolerance towards you know, religion in general in the US. Um, so, but the idea of a Muslim businessman is not horrifying to many Muslims, but that was also always limited to a more classical, you know, like a shopkeeper kind of thing. But this idea of more mod Muslim businessman, more modern, entrepreneurial, investing a lot of money, as like that's something new, and some people are criticizing it. It's, it's some more conservative thinkers in Turkey are saying that Turkish Muslims are being hedonistic; they're becoming consumerist. Uh, so there is an ongoing debate about the you know validity of a, a kind, kind of a, a successful capitalist you know, culture within Islam, and people have different ideas. Not, but not as in a wild reaction, but there's, there's criticism within Turkey itself to, uh, from the more conservative side. Again, uh, if, if, if I could briefly, briefly add something, I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very striking in the 19th century that there are banks in the Ottoman Empire, and it's, there was an awful lot of trade, but the banks are in the hands of other of the Armenians and Greeks. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry, all I'm saying is that you know, it's, it's all very well saying that there is that tradition in Islam, but in the 19th century, when the Ottoman Empire was still very much on the trade routes, they're not still. The bankers are, um, are Greeks or Armenians, mm. and uh, or Levantines, that sort of thing. But, and, it's, they, and the Turks, are, the Muslims that go on have dropped out of that world. It does need some explanation. <laughs> In the Ottoman Empire, non-Muslims became the Nuboisi. And when they were expelled, or the Ottoman lost, Empire lost them, or in the Armenian case, expelled tragically, uh, then Turkey became a country without any bourgeoisie. Most Muslims were peasants or bureaucrats because there was an idea of a veneration of state. That you know you should get into state and become a bureaucrat if you're not a peasant. So Turkey had an effort to create its own bourgeoisie mm. uh, with some, you know, with, with turning on a free market spirit. It was like a government funded uh, bourgeoisie, which we call the white Turks. They prospered under the ideology of the government. Now, the thing is the conservative bourgeoisie coming from inland Turkey uh, is coming from a more real underdog spirit. And they are the ones which you call the conservative Muslims right now. Whereas in the big cities in Istanbul, you would have the more westernized, you know, uh, whiskey and, you know, like a cigar sort of businessman uh, type. And I told you, you have the more mustache and his wife goes to mosques and with his make a letter when he says, Prophet Muhammad is a merchant. And that's a new type in Turkey. And I think that's interesting for the history of, before the rest of the Islamic civilization, because this is more interesting. I mean, of course you can be a secular Muslim, and you know, that's nice, but you're not very inspiring for most of the pious Muslim out there. But if you're religious, quite religious, but, in, but also if you engage in some things we call modern, then that's an interesting point. Uh, Mustafa, a question for you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, most religions, except Islam, uh, they have scriptures and they have God. God. Uh, and the position of God is that of an abstract principle in which there's a lot of space for creativity and uh, 
uh, changing your views uh, and approach to things as time passes. But as you said, that in Islam, Quran actually takes the place of the God, uh, which is actually of Jesus. Okay, of Jesus. Uh, uh, okay, I'm, I'm not very good at all this, so I'm just uh, 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 trying to. Uh, okay, let's say he takes the place of Jesus. Now, uh, so uh, if you put Quran in such a high place, which is higher than the scriptures as it is in other religions, uh, the thing is that you don't really leave any space for human creativity and independence there. Uh, so uh, my question is, comes back to the title of your speech, which is, is does Quran not uh, uh, make it, uh, takes over the place of capitalism uh, because uh, it replaces capitalism because it does not leave any space for creativity and freedom, so it does not really allow capitalists to take groups. Uh, well, I disagree. The thing is, first of all, what I said in my speech is Quran is equivalent to the idea of Logos in the fourth gospel, as the word of God became flesh in, in the Muslim mind. But actually, that was debated in, in, in again, early medieval Islam. And there were two camps about the nature of the Quran. And one camp argued that the Quran is created, the other one said it is uncreated. And what this means is this. The created Quran camp said, it is the word of God, but God spoke it at a certain time in history, at a certain context. The other people said, no, no, it is uncreated in the sense that it was with God since eternity. And it came down to seventh century as a you know, block of word. Um, I'm on the created Quran side, which says, I mean, it's word of God, but God spoke into a context. So and when God, God said this and this, I am according to that context and that culture and so on. So, so there is a different tradition that says, there's a tradition arising from this interpretation, which is the non-literalist interpretation. And even in the medieval era, there was Imam Shatibi who wrote the book about the Makassid, the purposes of the Sharia. And he said, there are little rules of the law, but there are intentions of the law. And the intentions are eternal, whereas the details can change. And he uh, noted those intentions as a protection of five principles, uh, life, uh, religion, the intellect, property, and project. Uh, so that is a so there is space for interpretation depending on how you look at the Quran itself. Plus, ninety percent of Islamic law is post-Quranic. The Quran covers a very little, you know, area. It's, it generally gives basic principles, and so in most of the legal matters, you don't enter into any territories defined by the Quran. And even you enter again, there is different interpretive tools. It's not that you know it's a little well. That's one line, of course. Yes. Could I? Could I ask? Um, if, if you are an Orthodox Christian, or oh, like so forgive me. If you're an Orthodox Christian, or if you're a Roman Catholic, but then yes, you believe that uh, God spoke to man through the Bible, but also through the Church. The, the, the councils of the Church are also uh, give the revealed Word of God. But but if you're a Protestant, if you're one of the more thoroughgoing Protestants, you will believe that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God, which is in itself sufficient for salvation. Uh, so um, I wouldn't like to put this um, contrast between the Quran, which is a supreme document, uh, and the Bible, which is not a supreme document. There are many shades within Christianity, and the uh, particular shade of Christianity to which I come, uh, which I don't necessarily subscribe, uh, puts the Bible in much the same position as uh, the Quran. So there's not that much difference. Yeah, Same so kind of my common topics for this distinguished panel. I have two questions. First of all, uh, Eo and uh, Mustafa. Uh, do you think that the instrument of sound credit? high market and real savings can be entirely substituted by the instruments that the current interpretation of Islam allows, allows like Muda Rabah, that is uh, uh, not having a straightforward time market, uh, but uh, where every capital transfer has to be a joint venture in a way. So flourishing market economy possible without the instrument of sound credit, at least in a straightforward way. 
The second question is, uh, Islam seems to offer a quite good basis for the criticism of paper money, which is not backed by commodities. Has this perception already uh, reached the public debate in, in some Islamic countries? I, I got the second question, but not the first one exactly. But can you reframe to the first question? Right. Is a flourishing market economy possible without straightforward credit because it's not allowed by the current interpretation of Islam? If every capital transfer has to be a joint venture in a way, or it's a mask, or it's a commodity based uh, transaction. Uh, so do, do you think that, that, that that's uh, what Islamic uh, economies might be lacking? It's an instrument of sound credit that Guido has uh, explained in this picture. Okay, first of all, I, mean, I don't believe in something called an Islamic economy. So there are people who believe in the Islamic economy and they think that means that everything should be venture capital, no interest taking. Uh, and I think that system is hard to really sustain. I mean, when you're, I mean, uh, in, well, in Malaysia, they're a thriving part of that, but there's a non-Muslim part of society, the Chinese, which are contributing to the economy. And it's just, there's no clear cut example. Uh, but I think, I personally think modern interest is not saving the usury. And many people think that way anyway. So I think it's a free economy, and Muslims who prefer that way can use that. And I think that interpretation will maybe be a little and less and less popular as time goes by. In Turkey right now, for example, the majority of the society use normal banking, and only maybe a tiny like a percentage of society goes to those Islamic banks. Uh, and and even those who go who say, well, we don't see much difference actually, but you know, at least to obey the clever law, we, 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 we're doing this. Um, and as for, sorry, I'm, I don't remember the second one was. It's the criticism of paper money. Which okay. Well, criticism of paper money. Well, there is the idea that you know the paper came, like, as a novelty, and you know uh, some people are arguing that, but I don't see any Islamic justification for paper money or or gold standards or even gold itself. There are some people who made that argument. There are some people who say in, in Prophet's time there were no paper money, it was just gold and silver, but there was no cell phones in Prophet's time as well, or no you know, hotels and so on. So uh, I don't think, it's, it, I think it's a rational argument. It's not a religious argument. And I think the problem in, in Islamic, you know, in some of the interpreters or some of the scholars or authorities of Islam is that they think that religion defines everything. Like, religion define, doesn't define traffic laws, and if you want to extract traffic laws from the Quran, you really cannot from the Sharia. So it is actually much more limited. And of course, religious answers have been given to lots of questions in history, but they were actually human answers, inspired from religion, but given, after all, by human beings who were scholars who taught it within their context. And instead of just arguing what an Islamic economy should be, I would rather prefer to argue, well, there's not no such thing. There are principles, there are values, uh, but the implementation of those can change and vary over time. Uh, and that idea is also, you know, uh, becoming popular among some Muslims, and especially, I would say, in Turkey, in the more the liberalist uh, strain of Turkey.
I hereby think that I have invented a square circle or something. You can buy such things and put your signature under this and then behave it in a way that you think is fitting to this. But this has, of course, nothing to do with uh, the problems that we confront in legal scholarship, in which we uh, insist on the principle that a contract, in order to be valid and enforceable, uh, must stipulate something that is possible. It's not possible that the same physical object, as you have I pointed out it belongs to two persons at the same time. So, in practice, what would this mean? I think that, of course, in a free society, people are free to put their signature again under any nonsense that they might come up with. It's a different question whether they would find any court accepting this, accepting this, and enforcing such uh, types of contracts. Islam and capitalism. I remember that 10 years ago, um, Barrow and McCleary published a comparative study about uh, the relationship between economic performance and religious belief. And the outcome was more or less that every kind of religious belief in a moderate way promotes uh, growth. Uh, negative correlations between religious fanatism and, uh, and economic growth and economic performance, which is quite obvious. Uh, on the other hand, I uh, said that, and I think that it's, uh, it's easy to explain it because every religion promotes uh, certain values which are uh, adapted and promote uh, sound uh, uh, social relations. Uh, on the other hand, say that uh, I think that we have to distinguish uh, between uh, Islam and Christianity regarding uh, their, uh, the, the concept of revelation. Because if you, uh, there, is a, there is a distinction between the Quran as the word as of God as such, and the Bible and the gospel containing of, uh, the word of God. So I mean. You have four Gospels with four different accounts of, uh, um, of, of, of the history of, of Jesus. No? Uh, you have a, a, a lot of space of uh, interpretation. And uh, history shows that uh, this, let's say, boundless or nearly boundless possibility to interpret the, 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 the faith uh, gave the possibility to the church to incorporate, for instance, the legal system of the Roman Empire, which was brought into the, the modern times. Uh, in the Islam, the, the Islamic religion, I think that these boundaries are much more narrow. You know, so the space for interpretation is much narrow. This, uh, I don't want to say that uh, it has not been, uh, uh, that there was no attempt to go beyond this by Islam, uh, Islamic enlightenment time or something like this, and the Turkish history, the Ottoman history shows that as well. But uh, the conclusion would be uh, that, that Islam is uh, the more efficient in the economic, from the economic point of view, the more it is heretic. More heretic. I really have the last thing. Is it a heretical idea that Islam is efficient? Excuse me? What was your emphasis on the idea of heretic? I didn't get that. Uh, to go beyond the orthodoxy of understanding of the Quran. So it's, uh, it needs to go beyond the orthodoxy of, of, of the understanding of the of, of Quran uh, to be efficient. Well, first of all, I agree with you that Islam, it's wrong to compare Islam to Christianity. There are important differences. If we really need it, you know, parallelism between any of those big religions, Islam is closer to Judaism than Christianity, with its emphasis on law, uh, with its uh, like, un, like very strong monotheism and doesn't its rejection of the doctrine of Trinity in the theological sense. Uh, maybe the first five books of the Torah can be then compared to the Quran as the ultimate revelation which God gave to Moses, and Moses is similar to Muhammad, so certainly more common than than Jesus is. Given in his message and in, in the way that Muslims and including Jews uh, and Christians understand them. Uh, and actually, maybe today the historical experience of Islam 
is a bit like the historical experience of Jews when they first faced enlightenment and modernity. Which, so you had different, you had a reformation in the sense that some remain orthodox, some you know, became conservative, you even had a reform Judaism. Probably something like that will happen to Islam, maybe it is happening right now already. Um, and some people even have argued that the Muslim position vis-a-vis -vis the West is a bit like the Jewish position vis-a-vis -vis Rome 2,000 years ago, in the sense that they had a Herod, a dictator, and installed by Rome, and they were fighting, and there were different reactions, zealots, and Pharisees, and so on, and that's an interesting argument. But to come back to your point, is there, do we need a heretical position on the orthodoxy to, you know, move on with something like this? I would not say heretical because those are already in the tradition. But yes, there is, I think, there is some uh, need of a renewal, a revival within the Sunni tradition. Because the Sunni orthodoxy has been formed in the second, third century in a specific context, in a specific, you know, environment. And those the interpretations of those scholars, the earliest scholars, became unquestionable norms. And actually, there's an effort to question them since the late 19th century. Uh, late 19th century Muslim liberals from the Ottoman Empire or Egypt or from the Arab world, uh, like uh, Afghani in, in, in the Arab world or Abduk in, 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 in the Ottoman Empire, people like Nam and Kemal, they discovered, they said, much of the things which are in the West, like freedom and you know, free markets and economy and progress and rule of law and constitution, these are, they said, are actually compatible with our core values, but we got buried in time. That was the argument. The problem is that in the 20th century, because of the confrontation with the West, uh, many Muslims just were pushed to the other side. They became communists or socialists. Simply, they were fighting the West, and they thought, you know, this is a way to resist the West. They, if, they were, if you let them, I think, I'll hold them. I mean, not you, but I mean, I think if the Western world leaves it a little bit, I think there is room and there are sources within the tradition itself to come back with some of the liberal ideas. And it is, it is not an accident that in the turn of the 20th century, all prominent Muslim thinkers were liberals who said, the West has great things and we should learn from them. You just roll back to the 1930s and you find many of them, or many of the people who replaced them, becoming more and more strident against the West. Because they lost the caliphate, they were colonized, and they saw, you know, all those uh, like Western intrusion in their countries, and West became the enemy rather than a successful model you can learn from. And I think uh, in countries that you did not have the same experience in Turkey, Malaysia, you, know, you are actually seeing it something different. And, uh, or um, you should not expect a liberal Islamic strain to come from Gaza when it's just under occupation. They're fighting, and that's the only thing they know. Uh, or from like tribal areas in Pakistan, which has no access to anything which is modern. But from places which you have a Muslim society which is modernizing in its own way. And that should be allowed. The problem is that that was not always allowed, either by the West or by secular dictators, who said all should be trashed out, and we should totally become French wannabes. And that's it. That was another, you know, the model of Turkey was like that. This is to Mustafa as well as uh, like a comment from Leo. And, uh, recently, the finance minister of Malaysia called for gold and dinar, but also he called for this to be the unit of account and the unit of settlement in their international trade. Count, I'm sorry? The unit of account as well as the unit of settlement for their international and he made this suggestion to the uh, Organization of Islamic Nations uh, that they, uh, they adopt this kind of thing. Uh, my question to you is whether you think this has any traction, whether you think this has any potential in the Islamic world. And Guido and Olivier, I'd like to ask a comment as to what do you think would happen if such a thing might well, I'll agree on this. I, I don't think so that much, at least from my experience in Turkey. That's not a big debate or an issue here in the, in the Islamic community in Turkey. 
uh, probably there would be people who would theoretically argue with that, but also places like Turkey is so integrated into the Western or the global economy that instead of initiating such a radical change, they would probably adopt to what is already out there. So uh, I think, uh, well, that's an interesting idea, but I don't see it very likely to you know, become the new, the dominant view all across the board, maybe some of them will support that. Right? Well, what would be the likely effect? Well, I one effect would be that there would be a stronger incentive for investors all over the world to hold at least uh, part of their portfolios in, in such countries that benefit from such a currency because there's a minimum of reserve is far superior to Western uh, paper currencies. So this would be uh, beneficial for uh, savers all over the world and would uh, benefit uh, those countries because there would be stronger capital inflows. And um, it would become a unit of account against which uh, the dollar could be uh, benchmarked or the euro. Whereas now, the euro is really benchmarked against the dollar, and they both get money, so when they both devalue together, nobody notices. Um, so I do think that there would be also a psychological effect which would uh, come out, out of the Islamic sphere, so it could be on that. But, but there's also the younger Orwell of the 1930s who was a state socialist. If you read The Road to Within Here, it, it doesn't really talk much about um, self-sufficiency and independence. Uh, it, it, it's not. Um, it, it's not a left anarchist tract. Orwell was in the 30s very much touched by state socialism. Um, but now, of course, uh, Orwell to some extent, recanted at the end of his life, and who is uh, Jamie Priestley uh, retracted uh, a lot of socialism in old age, Malcolm Muggeridge, who I just mentioned, uh, became quite a strong anti-socialist, and it is possible that many of the uh, socialist figures of the 1930s and 40s would have grown out of it if it had not been uh, encouraged by circumstances. Uh, but uh, going back to your question, I think Orwell must, in the 1930s at least, be regarded as part of the state socialist left. Yeah, I'm actually very really impressed by Mustafa's discussion about the similarities between Judaism and Islam. It's perfectly right. I mean, in terms of the, uh, the legal content of the Elijah, they're, they're almost identical. Uh, I, I was also impressed by Sean's comment that uh, the Bible is treated with, within, certainly the Protestant Christianity, really is the word of God in the same way that the Quran is. Uh, and one might also point to the fact that, uh, that Christians, Jews in the West, had prohibitions, every bit of script against interest as we find in the Muslim world. The first prominent Christian theologian who took a, made a distinction between commercial loans and loans were you indeed uh, uh, quoting, uh, trying to, trying to uh, elucidate the passage in Deuteronomy against, uh, uh, against increase uh, at the expense of your neighbors, Calvin, and then others in the 16th century afterwards, including some Jesuits, began to make these distinctions. So you can find a very similar history of restriction. And uh, in some ways, the Muslim notion of the hot value you know, the, uh, the way you sort of create a kind of uh, means or almost use a subterfuge, some sort of means by which you can carry out a loan and very often you don't look at the recipient and so forth. It's just a kind of blank loan. So uh, this is really developed in the Muslim world and then taken over by Christians later. But having said all these things, why is it that Muslims do not make the 
the sort of leap in, in the 18th century into a kind of modern capitalist economy, which people do in the West. Uh, I, I would also add the fact that the Jewish situation is different, because although they were very similar to the Muslims, they're talking about very small communities, which can then be brought into the West and, and Westernized, something which may be similar to the situation of Muslims in the United States. So when you're dealing with small numbers, perhaps it is, it is easier uh, to, to westernize them, um, as opposed to people living in a society with tens of millions of people who are held together by these, these legal restrictions. Uh, in any case, I sort of throw my question open to everyone, if anyone who cares to answer, why does the Muslim world not make that sort of leap into economic modernization uh, that you find being made by Christians and Jews? Um, <clears throat> sorry, I don't want to jump the gun, but uh, I've got something I hope uh, that's uh, to some interest. I mean, you could surely ask the same question about the Catholic world in the 18th, if you're talking about the 18th century. But again, you know, you, you, you're right to say that the Christian world was, was hostile to interest. But it's quite an interesting thing that the, uh, the uh, after the Council of Reformation, the, um, the, it's the church and the monasteries which take over that institution which we all know in the Protestant world, the pawn shop, you know, definitely. Uh, and, they, and they call it, in, in all Latin languages, it is called Mount of Piety. Because it was taken over, that thing was taken over by the church. And you find this extraordinary thing, the, the entrepreneur of Italy, or Catholic Belgium, or France as well, all go to Protestant countries, and the Protestant countries are the ones that take <coughs> off, whereas a very large part of Catholic Europe uh, languishes for a very long time. And there is that parallel with, with what happened with Islam. And it is specifically, again, Mediterranean. Perhaps it is to do simply with the fact that there's no air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> could um, supplement what Professor Stone has said. Um, I don't think it's at all fair to say that uh, Christianity, Christendom in the 18th century jumped in, into modernity, whereas Islam lay behind. Um, the jump into modernity happened in, it happened in Britain, it happened in Holland, uh, and to a much lesser extent in France. It, it didn't happen in many other places. Uh, the Catholic world was largely left behind, certainly Spain was. And once you look into the uh, Orthodox world in Russia, um, it was in at least uh, as bad a position as Islam. So uh, rather than us, you know, why is Islam left behind? The point is that all of humanity left behind uh, Britain, Holland, and to some extent France. Uh, both are the exceptions. This are not the exception at all. Uh, it is not fits in Iraq very well with the general pattern of human civilization. Uh, a bit better than some, a bit worse than others, but um, neither particularly good nor bad. Uh, the, the exception is uh, those three, uh, those three Atlantic uh, states from perhaps the early or the middle of the 17th century onwards. Well, I very much agree with uh, both the comments. The question is how the West made progress, whereas you know, Islam was just going its own way. Uh, but here's the question. The West, the, the Northern Europe basically created modernity. And others came, catch, started to catch up. I mean, Japan obviously did. Uh, and now China is in a, in a bizarre way of doing it to some of the decent capitalist system. Now, Muslims can, I can do the same thing, uh, and there are examples, as I said, there's no single Muslim world, like look at Turkey, Malaysia, Dubai, these are actually promising examples. But I think in the Muslim mind, there's one conceptual issue, and that is to learn from the ways of the ones who think, who are actually theologically wrong. I mean, to the infidels, the others, who are not blessed with the revelation you have, from the Muslim point of view, totally. How do you accept the fact that they have done really well in something, and then take it from them, and still feel loyal and proud of your tradition? And that's a question I think uh, many Muslims have been struggling in the through the 19th century. And this becomes worse when the other, the successful other, 
is also your enemy in the sense that its policies hurt you, it, it's a rival, it, it, its policies intimidate you. That's why I think you know, the, the Arab world became a Soviet ally, mainly most of them in the 20th century. Uh, Soviet atheism is much less friendly to Islam than you know, like, uh, liberal European societies, or even the theism in the Christian Europe. But they were forced to, you know, the, 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 the political confrontation makes it like, harder to accept something. You, have, you want to be the exact opposite of it. You want to defy them and reject them and so on. And that's about psychology. But also, some of the policies of the West also sometimes exacerbate that psychology in this part of the world. OK, we have um, five, six people waiting to speak. And we have only 10 minutes. 10 minutes, just to uh, give it a second. Okay. <laughs> so the topic I'd like to put in front of the panel is uh, uh, Novelist Blake's potential next book, uh, for which you may greatly enhance this reputation. Each member of the panel has something to say about the context that uh, might be in Novelist Blake's next book. Uh, the triggering event for counterfactual history might not be as neat as a motor accident in Prague in 1939. <laughs> but let's suppose that the stupid hubris of Britain in entering into the First World War did not happen from some concocted event or not novels like that in this novel. And the topics that might be addressed in this novel include not only no entry of Britain and far less slaughter, far less conflict in what is what started as the First World War. And to that, the United States doesn't enter the First World War. And to that, that the Bolshevik Revolution does not happen. And to that, we do not have the slavery of Germany under the Treaty of Versailles. And to that, therefore don't have the Weimar hyperinflation. Add to that, because we do not have the status of blowout of the First World War, that the central power of the central banks is less enhanced. Add to that, then we do not have the uh, fiat money boom of the 20s, nor do we have the Great Depression, nor do we have the rise of Hitler, nor do we have, therefore, the Second World War. Now, isn't this a topic that perhaps Blake should um, consider as his next novel? And I'd like to, I think each member of the panel has something to say about this, especially certain members of the panel, uh, as a counterfactual for the 20th century history. And indeed, perhaps the Nobel Prize in Economics would be a libertarian prize rather than a prize for the next sophistication in state intervention in the economy. Thank you, Bob, very briefly. Um, I, I agree with the First World War, the Great War was the great, great catastrophe of, of the 20th century. Um, however, once you try to write um, fiction in, in an alternative world where the First World War didn't happen, it, it does become extremely difficult because um, our thoughts, the words we use, the things we use, all the things around us have been um, determined by events that did happen after 1914. Uh, and to conceive a world in 2014 where the Great War didn't break down is not impossible, I think, that better not was the Richard Blake, but it's beyond Richard Blake's power. Uh, to give a brief example, uh, it's difficult to imagine that the internet would not have evolved in this parallel world, but what would we call the internet? Uh, that, that is uh, an American word. And it's unlikely that America would have been quite so dominant in uh, technology without the destruction of Germany. So uh, for, for that reason alone, Richard Blake decided not to um, go for a world in which the Great War had happened. It, it's much easier to extrapolate 20 years ahead from 1940 uh, than to extrapolate 100 years ahead from 1940. I want to add one important topic. Without can, that, can I just interrupt? Um, yeah. Um, Hans, um, 
I suggest that uh, if they want Nikolai and uh, want uh, answer or give their comment they want because they haven't you had a question uh, and after that we will uh, have to stop. Um, Anyone on the panel comment on this question and then we close. Yeah, sure. uh, well, one problem in this counterfactual history seems to be the assumption that um, the counterfactual of a government intervention is the lack of any government intervention. So we could very well imagine that uh, the lack of uh, um, the, the counterfactual to uh, wars and the government intervention that we saw would have been other interventions. And as a matter of fact, this is what we could logically suppose uh, to a given extent. Uh, knowing that there is at the beginning something like a government and that its nature and tendency is to expand. Uh, or, or the libertarian uh, prizes, as a matter of fact, there are uh, a number of libertarian prizes by uh, the Ludwig von Mises Institute uh, in Auburn. But the matter of the fact there is that these prizes are quite clear what they are about. They are about libertarianism and Austrian economics. They do, do not claim to be prizes about economics in general. So they do not hide their ideological bias quite to the contrary. Well, Mike, good moment. Is that on? Hello. Hello? Thank you. Um, well, I mean, with these counterfactual kinds of things, one, one of my comments would be that, that so many of the issues that we think of as arising in World War I were really well in train before the war started to, to accelerate these kinds of things, but they were already existent. So, um, you might imagine things uh, sort of rolling out a little bit differently, but uh, it might be surprising how many, how many, how many kinds of patterns and so forth would remain the same. I mean, I think about, um, I think about these issues to do with Iran since I've been thinking about this a lot, and um, you know, some of these patterns were there kind of irrespective of World War One, and it, it kind of altered the altered the thing, but uh, you know, it's. It's it's almost uh, it's almost like the, the Marxist view of Hitler, if not Hitler, than somebody else to, to fill that role in the Marxist kind of uh, interpretation. And, and you know, I, I, in that in that sense, I think that's that's real possibility. But who knows? Does anybody else on the panel want to comment? Anybody on the panel want to comment on this one? First of all, okay. In that case, I, I, I thank you all, and please keep in mind that we are very much in a hurry uh, to uh, get the photos done uh, and then load the buses to go out for, for the day. So please, please go to the